crown him with many crowns. <clears throat> Let's all stand together. <clears throat> that the Lord Jesus Christ to be magnified, glorified, that we would be irresistibly drawn to him, to trust him for everything in this life and in the life to come. <clears throat> we have a very special day today. We're going to observe the Lord's table and we're going to witness uh, believers' baptism for three uh, new believers that the Lord has called out of darkness into his marvelous light. I can't think of a greater joy for a body of believers than to witness baptism. So very, very thankful for that. Um, I'm sure that most of you have met Larry and Susie from Montana. I've been out there a couple of times and preached for them. And uh, Eric, you went out there with me one time. Bert, you, you went out there, um, and um, just a sweet group of believers out there. Larry and Susie just told me this morning that a couple that are faithful brethren in the fellowship out there, Larry and Sharon Grimes, um, their only son, uh, who was in his 30s, was uh, snowmobiling yesterday and was killed in an avalanche and so uh, you know the Lord told us to bear the burdens of one another and I can't think of a greater burden than to lose a child so uh, I want us to pray for Larry and Sharon Grimes as they suffer with the grief that they're having right now 
over the loss of their son. Oh, let's, uh, let's pray together. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful that you've once again brought us here to this place. You've given us a desire to hear thy word, and Lord, how we pray that you would now give us ears to hear, and that you would warm our hearts in faith to rest all our hope and all our desire on thy dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we do uh, pray for our brethren, for Larry and Sharon, and Pray for them in the loss of their son, Eric. Lord, ask that you would comfort them as no man can provide them comfort in this time. Lord, that you would assure their hearts of your salvation and your grace and uh, the supply of your mercy would be abundant to them. For our brethren that are in Great Falls, Lord, that you would use this time to strengthen them as a body and unite their hearts together in Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, last night the Lord changed the direction that uh, I was to go this morning in this first message. And I uh, just felt a need to preach a message on baptism. And so I want to be very deliberate and uh, as clear and simple on the subject of baptism that I can possibly be in these next few minutes. Um, men have always rest the scripture to their own destruction. Men have always taken the word of God and uh, made it to mean things that it doesn't mean. Uh, the Lord has written his word in such a way as to give the unbeliever enough rope to hang himself. And uh, when God says that he sent a strong delusion, those who had no love for the truth, no love for Christ... God sent them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. And if you listen to the delusion that men have, it's always based on Scripture. The means by which God sends the strong delusion is his word. It's his word. Men take the word of God and they rest it and they twist it and they pervert it to mean things that it doesn't mean. And they rest the hope of their salvation in their error. The Lord said to the Pharisees, he said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. And I don't want to be guilty of that. I don't want to be erring when it comes to the scriptures. I want to understand by the grace of God what the Lord meant clearly when it comes to this subject of baptism and everything else relative to the gospel for that matter. Now, there are three errors, as I can see, that religious people make when it comes to baptism. The first one is that they will say, Baptism is unnecessary for salvation and therefore it is of little consequence or no consequence at all. And that is to err when it comes to the scriptures. Um, if a person refuses to be baptized, what they are saying is that I don't believe God's word. Um, if they think that baptism is, is of no importance or is insignificant, uh, they are denying the clear teaching of God's word. Uh, turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3, please. 1 Peter 
chapter 3. We'll begin reading in verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. He bore all the sins of all of his people in his body upon the tree and suffered the wrath of God in order to establish justice for God's people. No sin can go unpunished. The just for the unjust. The one who was himself without sin bore and owned to himself the sins of his people that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the Spirit of God. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Now, here's a verse of scripture that men will pull out of context and they'll say, well, the Lord, after his death, went to hell and preached to the devils. That's, that's not the reference here. The reference here is, into the, is in the following verses. Which sometimes were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. So the spirit of Christ was preaching through the ministry of Noah to those disobedient souls that lived during the days of Noah. But only eight were saved. Only those who were in the ark were saved. In other words, the disobedient souls in the days of Noah did not believe God. Now we're, we're, we're dealing with the subject of Baptism is of no importance. It's not necessary. The life, the like figure, now here it is, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now what's a good conscience towards God? A good conscience towards God is to believe God. That's what a good conscience towards God is, is to believe everything God says. Now, a person who says that baptism is of no consequence or it's insignificant or I can be saved and I don't need to be baptized, what they're saying is they don't believe the clear teaching of Scripture. And at any point where you don't believe God, you are an unbeliever. Believers believe everything God says. So men rest the scriptures when they say that baptism is insignificant or unimportant or unnecessary because by saying that, they are saying, I don't believe God. I don't believe God. It's not baptism that saves. It's not the putting away of the flesh that saves. It's faith that saves. And faith believes God. <laughs> So a person who says that baptism is unnecessary, and I've heard people say that. I've heard people under my preaching say, well, I believe the gospel, but I don't need to be baptized. That's, that's not important. And what you're saying by saying that is that you don't believe the gospel. We're not, I'm not, what I'm just saying, we're not talking about folks out there on the fringe. We're talking about people that sit under the gospel who have come to that conclusion. If we're saved by grace, we're saved in the covenant of grace, we're saved from the foundations of the world, we're saved through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, then and we're not saved by works, then I don't want to make a work out of baptism. So anything that, 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 you know, baptism is just, by saying that, you are saying, I don't believe God. I don't believe God. The scriptures clearly call on us, as we're going to see in a few more verses. The second error that men make is to make baptism necessary for salvation. <laughs> that's, the, that's the opposite extreme, isn't it? Um, they make a work out of baptism. They, and, and many people do that. Many religious groups will say 
that there are certain things you have to do in order to be saved, and baptism is one of them. Um, some of us came out of Catholicism. I, uh, you know, you, that, that's, a, that's a big teaching in the Catholic Church, and there's many Protestant groups that have carried on that tradition. If baptism is necessary for salvation, what person in the scriptures is given to us as the clearest most unquestioned experience of being saved. <laughs> the thief on the cross. The, the loud of the Lord's mouth, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. If baptism is necessary for salvation, then what God said didn't happen. It didn't happen. So those are two errors that men make. The third error that people make when it comes to the subject of baptism is to baptize babies. Um, it used to be a time when I felt a need to contradict that error with, in great detail with all sorts of arguments from Scripture, but I'm beyond that now. Uh, baptizing babies is contrary to the gospel at every level, every level. Baptism is for believers. If you listen to people who talk about, and the, the Protestant groups that have carried over this baptism of babies is just a carryover from Catholicism. Um, and and they, will, they will say, well, you know, the child's not saved, but he is a member of the covenant of grace. No, the children are not members of the covenant of grace. There's only one way to become a member of the covenant of grace, and that's through the new birth. That's through the new birth. And the new birth happens when God enables a sinner to rest all his hope on the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So that out of the way, what saith the scriptures concerning baptism? Well, baptism is a very simple, simple, uh, just uh, baptism is the gospel. <laughs> it's the gospel. It's not confusing. It's not contradictory. Um, it's, uh, you know, Paul, in writing to Timothy, he said, I, I fear lest as, um, as Eve was, uh, was, was uh, deceived by Satan in the garden, that you should be drawn away from that simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Um, baptism is, a, is an outward sign, an outward picture of union with the Lord Jesus Christ. Union with Christ. And we see that in the baptism of the Lord Jesus himself. You remember when uh, the Lord came to the River Jordan where John was baptizing and uh, God had already said to John, the one whom you see the Spirit of God to come down on, he it is that's the Christ. And uh, you know that's still true. In order to know who it is that's the Christ, God has to reveal to us what he revealed to John. The Spirit of God comes down upon him and anoints him in the full power of the Spirit of God to accomplish the purpose for which God sent him. And, uh, and when John saw that, the Lord came to John and said, John, you're going to baptize me. And what did John say? Oh, Lord, I'm not worthy to baptize you. You, you need to be baptizing me. I'm not worthy to, to unlatch the, the, your sandals. To be the lowest servant and wash your feet is what John was saying. And, uh, and the Lord said, he said, suffer it to be so, for it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ was necessary in order for righteousness to be established in order for righteousness to be fulfilled. If anyone's baptism saves, it is the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what did his baptism represent? 
Well, later on, the sons of Zebedee, James and John, sent their mother to the Lord to to appeal to the Lord for her sons to be on his right hand and on his left hand when he entered into his kingdom, thinking that he was going to be an earthly king. And, uh, and, And the Lord said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup from which I drink and to be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with? And James and John said, we are. We're able. And the Lord said, And you shall indeed drink of the cup that I'm going to drink from and be baptized with the baptism that I'm going to be baptized with. The word baptism, the very word means to be immersed. It means to be immersed, which makes the whole idea of sprinkling babies or anybody else for that matter it it takes away the whole picture. The Lord Jesus Christ was immersed. He was immersed in the faithfulness of his obedience to the Father, and he was baptized by fire on Calvary's cross when he drank of that cup, the cup of sin. He drank of that cup and bore the full wrath of God's justice as he hung on Calvary's cross as our sin bearer, as our substitute, and was baptized with the fire of God's wrath. And in him (laughs) were all those for whom God chose in the covenant of grace, all those for whom he lived, he was now dying for. That's why Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. So the life of Christ is my life. The death of the Lord Jesus Christ is my death. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is my resurrection. And baptism just simply pictures that. I am identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I really drank of the very cup that he drank from. And I really suffered the baptism that he suffered when I was in him on that day when God poured out his wrath to put away my sin. Baptism has everything to do with union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is the believer's first step of obedience, confessing publicly before God's people that all my hope is in the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is my life. I have no life outside of Christ. Not before God. Not before God. That's the gospel, isn't it? (laughs) Union with Christ is the gospel. And that's what baptism is all about. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. So uh, back, to, back to Noah and his family, uh, they were saved by water. <laughs> you see, the same water that destroyed the earth is the water that lifted up the ark. And the same wrath that was poured out on the Lord Jesus Christ is the wrath that will, that will punish for eternity those who are not found in Christ. But it is the wrath of God that lifts up the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our ark. Oh, to be found in him, not having our own righteousness, which is of the law, but that righteousness, which is by the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's that's the water that's being spoken of there in 1 Peter. So look at what Paul says to the church at Colossae in Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. For in him... The Lord Jesus Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So here's the incarnation of God. God was made flesh and dwelt among us. Fully God, fully man, the word of God comes and dwells among us. 
and the fullness of the Godhead, all the attributes, all the nature, all the characteristics of God Almighty are in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you are complete in him. (laughs) So everything that God requires from a sinner, he looks to Christ for. You are, that's the next verse. Look, you are complete in him, which is the head of, of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. A circumcision was the cutting away of the flesh. This is a circumcision of the heart. The circumcision of the heart means that I'm not looking to anything that I do for the hope of my salvation. I'm not looking to any fleshly work For my acceptance before God, I'm looking for the circumcision of the Lord Jesus Christ, which his flesh was cut away when God put him to death on Calvary's cross. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So it's the faith and the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ that, that, that obligated God to raise him from the dead. Baptism is just simply declaring the hope of all my salvation is my union with Christ, my spiritual oneness with him. Even as, a, as the scripture says, a man is to leave his father and his mother and to be cleave unto his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Here's, the, here's the, the, the bride and the bridegroom, the head and the body. We are one together with Christ. So we're not looking to our circumcision. We're not looking to something that we've done with our hands. We're looking to what God did when he circumcised the Lord Jesus Christ on Calvary's cross. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, that's where we were. When we were outside of Christ before the new birth, we were dead in our sins. Hath he quickened, that means to be made alive. That's the resurrection. That's the resurrection. That's the reference to the resurrection. God quickened the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture calls him the firstborn among many brethren. So it's the resurrection of Christ that gives me hope that God's going to raise me. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven all of your trespasses. There's baptism. Baptism is publicly identifying my hope in the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ for all my acceptance before God. Not anything I do, but everything that he did. Secondly, baptism is a command from God. When the Lord right before the Lord ascended back into glory. He instructed the disciples when he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. (laughs) All power has been given unto me, all authority. And the only power that any man has, you know, religious leaders love flexing their muscles and using their fleshly power to intimidate men, the only power that any man has is the power that resides in the word of God. If I'm able to stand here and say, thus saith the Lord, the power is in Christ, the power is in his word. The power doesn't reside in a man. The man has no authority. It's the word of God that has all authority. And God's people bow to that authority. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, all power has been given unto me by God in heaven and in earth. And I, I'm the one that's going to save and I'm the one that's going, to, that's going to reign sovereign in the hearts of my people. Go ye therefore. And, uh, you know, the Lord sends a man to the mission field. That's, that's great. 
But you know, the, 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 the literal interpretation of go ye therefore is this. You can look it up. As you are going, <laughs> as you are going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth. Might God give us an opportunity to, as we are living our lives in this world, to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and when we do, they're going to want to be baptized, those whom the Lord saves. We, I'd ne we never, I never talk to anybody about being baptized individually. I pray the Lord, the Spirit of God, is speaking to somebody's heart right now. Because I think there's folks that say they believe what they've heard, but they haven't submitted. It's the first step of obedience at baptizing. Baptize them in the name of the Father. He's the one who elected the people of God sovereignly according to his will and purpose in the covenant of grace before Adam was ever called. You know, in, in religion, they talk about when someone's baptized, they say, well, a new name's been written in heaven. No, no new names are written in heaven. Those names were written before the foundations of the world. The Lamb's Book of Life has, is an eternal book. All the names of all of God's people. So we're baptized in the name of the Father, knowing that he's the one who chose a people. We're baptized in the name of the Son, knowing that he's the one who who was sent to redeem those whom the Father had chosen and were baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit, knowing that he's the one who opens our eyes so that we can see, opens our ears so that we can hear, and gives us a new heart to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this matter of salvation is a cooperative work of grace by the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so when we're baptized, we're baptized in all three persons of the triune Godhead. That's what baptism is. It's confessing faith that salvation's of the Lord. <laughs> my election was of God. My redemption was of God. My regeneration was of God. And I'm confessing that all the hope of my salvation was in the work of God. <clears throat> Thirdly, baptism is the pattern of preaching in the New Testament. The very first sermon that was publicly preached after the ascension of Christ is found in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Peter stood up. Peter, of all people. <laughs> now there's an example that God's not looking to the power of man. We, Peter was probably the weakest of all the disciples. I mean, he was the most, he was the most like water. He was the most unreliable and fickle and, 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 you know, and yet God used Peter to preach the gospel on the day of Pentecost. Well, there's a humbling example. God uses men like Peter, men like me, to preach the gospel. And uh, that he might get all the glory. <laughs> that no man could glory in his presence. But Peter concluded that message by saying, God hath made this same Jesus whom thou hast crucified, both Lord and Christ. God hath made him. You crucified him. God made him Lord and Christ. And the scripture says that they were cut to their hearts and said, what can we do? And Peter didn't say, there's nothing you can do. Just go home and hope that God, you know, God speaks to you. You have some experience. You have some warm feeling overcome you. No, he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And on the authority of God's word, I can stand here this morning and say to you, repent, change your mind about how it is that God saves sinners. He doesn't save sinners by their works. 
He saves them by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Change your mind about who you are. You're a sinner. You've got no righteousness. You've got nothing to offer God for your acceptance before him. Change your mind about who he is. He's the sovereign God who holds, as you said this morning, Bird, in our prayer time, he holds your soul in his hand. And he will do with it whatsoever he wills. And when you come to believe that, you'll have no option but to beg him for mercy. And our God delights in showing mercy. He delights in showing mercy. So this is not a fatalistic thing. God says, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Every one of you. There's no exceptions. That story in Acts chapter 2 goes on to say, Then they that gladly received the word that same day were added unto the church 3,000 souls. They were baptized. 3,000 of them. There's only a dozen disciples. <laughs> you know, they, they, so they didn't interrogate them. They didn't put them through a new members class. They didn't make sure they, they had all their theology straightened out. No, they heard and they believed and they submitted obediently to the will of God by being baptized. Fourthly, and my last point, what is the requirement for baptism? Well, you remember the story of the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8. The scripture says that he had been to Jerusalem for to worship. He had heard of the God called Jehovah, who was the God of the Jews. And I'm sure that he had investigated every other God that he could possibly hear about to try to figure out how can a man be right with God. And he went to Jerusalem in hopes of finding salvation. And he didn't. In the Jewish religion, they were still bound by the law. He didn't find the gospel. But he had a copy of scripture. <laughs> and going back to Ethiopia... Still searching. He's reading from Isaiah chapter 53. And though he didn't find God, God found him. <laughs> God took Philip from Samaria. and said, Philip, taking you down to Gaza, taking you to the desert. Now, there was a, there was a revival taking place where, where, where Philip was. And Philip must have thought, you know, Lord, there's, you're doing a work here. Why would you... No, because every lost soul is of infinite importance to me. And there's one man riding on a chariot, reading the scriptures, who I'm purposed to save, and I'm going to send you to preach the gospel to him. And Philip joined up with him going in that chariot. And you remember the Ethiopian? And Philip said, understand is what thou readest? Now you can just imagine what poor Philip would have been dressed like. You know, some sort of desert Bedouin coming up to a, a man in a chariot who was the, 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 the treasurer of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia. This man was wealthy. This man was powerful. He probably had a large entourage with him. And yet God put it in the Ethiopian eunuch's heart to say to this humble Philip, how can I lest a man should guide me? I need, I need someone to explain to me what this says. And that's what preaching is. And so the Ethiopian had been reading from Isaiah chapter, chapter 53 where, uh, where the Lord said he was led like a sheep to the slaughter and as a, as a lamb uh, before his shearers was dumb. He didn't open. He opened not his mouth. And the Ethiopian said, is is this scripture talking about Isaiah or is he talking about another? And, uh, and, the Ethiop and Philip 
began right there in Isaiah chapter 53, the scripture said, and preached unto him Jesus. No, he's not talking about him. He's talking about another. He's talking about the sin bearer. He's talking about the one who is the life of his people. The one to whom we must trust and identify with for all of our salvation. And after the Ethiopian heard the gospel, he, they came upon a, an oasis, I assume, there in the desert. There was some water. And the Ethiopian said, look, there's some water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? <laughs> and what did uh, what, what Philip say? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou canst. Now, don't misunderstand that statement. Because every believer can say, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. So what does that say about all of our heart? You see, we're always conflicted, aren't we? There's always unbelief involved in our faith. And yet the Ethiopian said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now that's what's required for salvation, uh, for, for baptism. I believe that Jesus, Jehovah does the saving, is the Christ, the anointed one, the one Son of God to accomplish the salvation of his people. And I believe that he is the Son of God. He's all-powerful and sovereign, and if I'm going to be saved, he's going to have to do it. And I believe that with all my heart. Do you believe that with all your heart? All your heart. I, you know, I don't know much. And, and there's a lot of things I'm conflicted about. But if there's anything I believe, it is that. It is that. Follow the Lord Jesus Christ in baptism. They came off the chariot. He was baptized. Philip was caught away, went back to wherever God sent him. And the Ethiopian went on his way, a believer, baptized in the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's take a break.